So Chris Chan. <laughs> Chris Chan's back. I guess. He's back. Also, I'm sorry if you think it's offensive that I call this person a him. But I know very little of Chris Chan, except what you've told me. And uh, that's that's how I like to keep it. Yeah. The the, the documentarian aspect of it, the the complete history of Chris Chan that's at like 70 parts right now on YouTube and each episode's like 40 minutes plus is just I think Chris Chan might be one of the most documented people on the internet. At least one of the most documented people on the internet who themselves are not documenting yes. themselves. Yes, absolutely. But of this, the modern era. But this figure um, somehow got out of prison. Yes, as many people do. I vehemently claims that they didn't fuck their mom and rape them, which I just don't believe them at all. And... Now is back to making videos on YouTube. <laughs> so that was a, that's a, a quick turn of events. That's a that's an interesting dynamic shift. Anyway, this is this is not a Chris Chan podcast. Thank, thank God, God. Uh, but welcome to Duels and Mana Dorks, the D and D and MTG podcast. I'm Connor and I'm Sam, and we are the Dungeon Bros. But we are not brothers, nor are we in a dungeon. Yes, yes. And we're gonna we're gonna get better at that. We're gonna get better. Last episode we renamed the podcast to, Rebrand to Duels and Mana Dorks. Cause D and D and then Dual Lands and Mana Dorks being it's a whole it's a whole thing, but I think that's an <laughs> But Chris Chad that I can't No nope. I'm obsessed with this figure. You are. Say, Stop it. I, I, Seek I, help. <laughs> Go to therapy. It's so fascinating though. It's genuinely like they like people just bullied a person into becoming like the worst person imaginable. Yeah. It's I find that fascinating and sad. And then I struggle to feel sad because they're kind of the worst. You're the worst. Anyway. You are the German sausage. Anyway, uh last episode or last week actually no, since since the last episode, Sam, yes. you're old. Yeah. You're an so old man. I have back problems now and knee problems, and uh, I like to go to bed at 8.30. That's, that sounds actually like me. <laughs> <laughs> actually going to bed at 8.30, most night, as close to 8.30 as I can most nights. I'm ready for dinner at 4.30. Yeah. Cafeteria-style food is even better now. I, 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 cafeteria food's always been good. Like I'd, But that's, a, that's like a thing, is old people like to eat at cafeteria-style restaurants. Yeah. Yeah, I've got nothing against that. I'm honestly a fan. But Samuel, he, he, he since the last episode of the podcast, he has turned 29. I have. He's an old man. Old He's an old man. man. Uh, one of the gifts that I got him was a Doctor Who collector booster. Yes. Pack. We Single that. pack, not a box. I'm not balling out. We that opened hard. that last night on our uh, Monday night magic stream. Yes, every Monday on TikTok Live, we play Magic the Gathering. Two-player commander. Sometimes we'll open up some jumpstart boosters. Good jumpstart boosters, not bad jumpstart boosters. But, oh, the cat found the string, and now she's going to be rubbing on my leg for a half hour trying to get me to throw it. And I'm not going to. Fair enough. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to give in. This cat is insatiable with this fucking string. I swear to God. We, you've gotten her toys in the past. She doesn't care about toys. She doesn't care about the toys at all. Does she love a little feather on a string on a rod? Yep. Does she love a a, a piece of string that you cut off of a costume piece? Yep. Even more. That is, this is by far the most she has loved any object, and it's literally like seven inches of cording from some Amazon like forearm bracers. And she's upset. I'm gonna, here. If you're watching the podcast, ow, rude. If you're watching the podcast live on TikTok, this is it. The ends are all fucking frayed because she's been playing with it, and it's literally just cord. I, I don't know what to do about this cat. She's kind of a bitch. I love her to death, though. I love her to death. And now that the string is on the floor again, she's going to be rubbing against my leg, trying to get me to throw it. Throw it, yes. But 
What'd you get from your from your collector booster pack? I mean, there wasn't too much valuable in there. It was what the thirty dollar pack, thirty yeah. dollars. I think we got about twenty dollars worth of value. Um, not that we, not that you should be cracking packs for value. No, that's a dumb plan. Uh, but I think the most uh, valuable cards were Quantum Misalignment and Hero's Blade, both in Surge Foil, which is so much better than most foiling. The Surge Foil we were, we were talking about this a little bit earlier is. Um, Pokemon has foiling on lock. Oh my like god! Like all they, the different styles. Hundred percent. And they're super cool. And I notably, say, don't. I would even say Yu-Gi-Oh has really good foiling too. I've never actually looked at a Yu-Gi-Oh foil. They card. get they get they get crazy with the foiling patterns. Um, and also, as far as I'm aware, they don't Pringle, which Matt, MTG Wizards finally recently started to figure out. You know, cards that they switch printers or whatever, but now the foils Pringle way 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 less. Yeah. But these surge foilings are really dope. Um, but yeah, so nothing nothing too exciting in there. A couple of things that I could slot into some different decks. Um, but other than that, well, I'm I'm glad that you got I'm glad that you got some. I because literally just the collector boosters are just foiling and extended art versions of the cards that are in the four commander decks. Yes. So that, so like if you're cracking these collector boosters and you like Doctor Who and you just want some commander staples, like it's not that bad. Um, there are some serialized. There are some serialized cards. Uh, there's a, a couple different ones that are serialized in there, and of course, if you crack one of those, you can you can probably uh, pop it on pop it into a into an internet uh, purveyor and sell it for a decent amount. Oh yeah, like hundreds or thousands of dollars probably. Um, like, serialized cards are stupid, but uh, I love them. Yeah, again, you. Uh, I was not anticipating a serialized card in in this pack because yeah. it's in less than one percent of boosters that you can find serialized cards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Much less. It, 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 collector boosters are such a bad investment. Oh yeah, they're horrible, and I think that's kind of the purpose. I think that's the, the point. Um, all right, we talked about Christian already. We did. Okay, we can I have on. the list of things Oof. that I want to I want to bring up because I'm forgetful. And I just wanted to bring up Chris Chan because I know it was, it would upset Sam. <laughs> you need a new obsession. <laughs> That's a little, I, I the 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 stories that are told that are real life. He he burned his fucking house down because it was such a massive hoarding problem, and he wanted to use a coffee maker, but there wasn't an outlet available, so they had to run an extension cord from the bathroom, and they it had been there for so long that the opening and closing of the door to the bathroom had frayed the 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 sheathing on the extension cord such that when he used the coffee maker, it caught the house on fire. Well, the story. Moral of the story: don't uh, don't run extension cords between rooms, friends. Moral of the story: uh, don't give in to the haters <laughs> and the trolls. You know, just. Just go out there and try to find yourself a good, honest sweetheart, you know? Try and try and <laughs> go into public with sides that are saying you're looking to find your sweetheart taped to your chest. <laughs> Let's move on to Halloween thoughts. I, I, I'm curious about your Halloween thoughts because that's the next bullet point on our, on our list of things. I fucking hate Halloween. You do? I'm not a fan. Which part? Never of, been a fan. Which part of Halloween? All of it. All of it? Yeah. You don't like getting candy? No. Oh. Well, I, I, the candy part was fine. I didn't like the going door to door part and the, oh, what are you supposed to be? And I'm like, clearly I'm Spider-Man in a winter coat. What the fuck do you want from me? I had, the, I, I vividly remember as a child having the Spider-Man costume, mm-hmm. wearing the winter jacket over the costume because the costume is like fucking spandex it's it's thinner than a sheet of paper it's thinner than tissue paper sometimes it it, it, i don't know i don't know where they get off i I feel like it's more expensive to manufacture fabric that that, that's that thin than simply saving on the material cost of the fabric to just Mm. make something a little thicker but i digress i vividly remember as a child dressing up in the spider-man costume i'm fucking thrilled I love Spider-Man. He's my fucking boy at the time. This is a pre-MCU universe that we yes. live in, and Tobey Maguire is king at that point. It is then like 45 degrees out, and my mother insists on wearing the puffy winter jacket on top of the costume. Yep. And then 
I proceed to go to all of the houses and all of the neighbors and everyone that I interact with regularly. And we're going around, we're getting our candy, we're doing our thing. And every single house is, what are you supposed to be? I'm like, I'm fucking Spider-Man. I've been talking for weeks about how excited I am that I get to be Spider-Man. And you can tell because I'm wearing the mask. I have the web shooters and I unzip the jacket to show it off. Every single time I get to the door, you know that I'm Spider-Man. I don't want to be having this conversation multiple times over. Also, why the fuck are you giving me carnival peanuts? Oh, They're oh. garbage. Yeah. Fucking Circus peanuts are... Trash. 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 The worst. What are your thoughts on... What, do you have any Halloween stories that what? get you <laughs> emphatically enraged like I do? I don't think like that enraged, but growing up, I was always, you know... Whatever costume I would want to be, my mother would make the costume. Mm. Um, my mother knows I had how a to sew. Of those. I had a yeah, my mother knows how to sew, but of course, I didn't want a hand sewn costume because that meant it was going to be you know cheap fat from Joanne. Mm. Which, understandably, you know, we didn't grow up super wealthy or anything. Um, and and looking back, I'm like, oh, I know why a lot of things were happening the way yeah. they did. But of course, as a kid, you don't care. You just want you know I I wanted to be the Green Power Ranger. <sighs> The Green Power Ranger. I was the Blue Power Ranger Ooh. once because the, I think the, they were sold out of the Green Power Ranger. Everybody wanted to be the Green Power Ranger. Because the Green is cool. Yeah. You could do it. Everybody, a lot of people wanted to be the White Power Ranger. Or, uh, But anyway, so. I didn't know. I don't mean that. But I remember that one. Uh, um, but I, I, I was actually thinking about this this year because now that as an adult, uh, I do buy my costumes and for, for yearly Halloween parties. Um, this year I went as a Jedi and, and the Jedi, this is the third time I've been a Jedi in my life. Uh, each time I get a little better high school and no point of view completed the requisite training. No, unfortunately I've never undergone the trials. Yeah. Uh, but in high school I was, I was a handmade Jedi costume, Mm -hmm. uh, made from a, a, a deconstructed curtain. Oh, wonderful. All right. Wonderful. Uh, then a couple years ago, I bought just the robe and wore basically some, like, stuff underneath in the Heather. And then this year, I finally bought more pieces to it. Uh, but I realized that is now my second highest uh, worn costume. Number three is a Big Mac. A Big Mac? Yes. Like I, from McDonald's? Yes. I was a Big Mac for several years as a, as a young child. Wow. From probably age five to eight or nine. Then, then the uh, then the Jedi, and then my most worn costume was a vampire costume. Of course, the only fabric that my mother found at the store at the time was for a cape, what had bats on it. Of course. So I was a bat. I was a vampire wearing a black bat co- cape, but the bats were shiny. Mm. They were reflective, mm-hmm. and so every mm-hmm. and so a lot of the times when I'd walk up to especially old people's houses, they'd look at me and go, "Are you Liberace?" <laughs> <laughs> and I was probably that I was the Liberace vampire for I think five Halloweens. Wow. Wow. I don't know. Oh watch yourself, cat. I don't I feel bad. My mom didn't make many costumes. By the time I was around, uh there was a big enough gap between my older siblings and I that we we're my family was in a much more stable financial position than they were when my brother and sister were doing like Halloween and trick or treating, so I would I would got like the Power Ranger. I was Spider Man, like that kind of shit. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was in middle school, I vividly remember there was like a the, the middle school dance, the classic sure, middle school sure. dance. You're aware of this? The sock hop. We had oh what sock hop? What? That's 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 like the '60s term for a, f- a school dance. What? Yeah, look at the fu- why sock hop? Why? I don't, I don't know. What the fuck? Probably is that hop the- in your socks. The fuck do you mean hop in your socks? That doesn't mean anything. Google it. I don't know. That doesn't mean... Sock hop. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This is fucking ludicrous. Sock hop. Or socks hop. Often also called a record hop is just a hop was an informal sponsored dance event for teenagers in the mid-20th century North America featuring popular music. Why? Revival? Owl City's Fire... What? 
Okay, I can't. I can't do this right now. I can't do this right now. This is this is fucking stupid. I can't. I'm not doing this right now. But, god damn, that like that pisses me off. <laughs> the the middle school dance was around Halloween, my sixth grade year, and I wanted a costume, but I was I was like super shy, and I didn't want to dress up how I like in the things that I wanted to dress up. Mm-hmm. I was like I was into anime. I was in like I wasn't going to be a fucking Naruto ninja Mm -hmm. in middle school because I would have been mercilessly bullied as I was already mercilessly bullied. Right. And my mom could tell the turmoil and she was very, very kind. And she was like, this is kind of like a funny joke. It's low key. You don't have to worry about like a fancy costume or anything. If it falls apart, it's whatever. She took like a bunch of miniature cereal boxes. Like you get the, the multi pack of the small cereal boxes and would cut out the front. So there was like all the things. And she like put it on a shirt with like bloodstains and stuff. And I was a cereal killer. Mm, Classic. As a, as a good, as a good pun. She was also an English teacher. So she loved a good, love, loved a word play, loved a word play. Uh, in hindsight, I was like such an asshole about that costume. I was so embarrassed the whole time. I hated it. It was not fun. In retrospect, that's funny as shit. It's a great, yeah, great bit. Big fan of that. Uh, but I think the the costume I'm most proud of it was our dueling Thors. Yeah, yeah. You um, you doing the regular post Ragnarok like fucked up haircut Thor. Yeah, I remember and that. And then and then I doing the the Avengers Endgame fat Thor with the hoodie and the wig and the bathrobe and the fingerless gloves and and the the brown paper bag of of I think I had a Rattler, like grapefruit Rattler. Yeah, I think was so. drinking. But that was a great costume. That's also a very easy repeatable one uh that you that you can pull out numerous times. And then of course the the more the better Halloween being the Ren Fair costume, mm. of course, as we discussed on a previous podcast, as it's Ren Fair season, it's the end of Ren Fair season. Yep, in the Greater Cincinnati area, which kind of sucks. This but. coming weekend is the final weekend. Yes, Halloween weekend. Halloween weekend. Yep. Yeah. I mean, everyone everyone shows up. All right, we're almost twenty minutes into the podcast. How about we fucking? All right. How about we fucking talk about some things? First of all, the Duels and Man and Dorks podcasts. Available podcast services around the globe. Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music. It's also posted to our YouTube channel. I'm thinking. Oh, no. Hear me out. Hear me out. I'm thinking. Should we take the TikTok live stream? Because we also record the podcast live on TikTok the day before it goes live on Tuesdays. It's going to be different next week because Sam's traveling. We can get to that later. But should we just take the live stream and then just use the good audio and splice them together and use that as the video? I remember we once talked about doing that, and uh, we decided not to because it was extra work. But we could. We could. We I feel like I've got, I've got the workflow so felt for the podcast. I feel like it would be a very simple ask, especially because it's Adventure Resolve. You can highlight the two things, and it'll auto-align them and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, might do that, might not. We also want to start doing some podcast clips, so we'll see. I think this podcast is going to have some good topics for that which if we do do those there's going to be on they're going to be on our tiktok instagram the youtube shorts possibly x formerly known as twitter we also have a discord server we do monday night magical live streams every monday where we play match the gathering two-player commander historic brawl style sometimes we'll open some uh some jumpstart packs and play a little bit of jumpstart a little bit of beginner magic the gathering style things and then when a set releases we like to we like to do the pre-release kit Mm -hmm. unboxings and pack openings and such and then, if you're interested in that, we have the Mox Field with our deck lists that hasn't been updated in a little while. We'll get to it. Upcoming releases, we talk about them every single week. Uh, Planescape Adventures of the Multiverse is out now. The most recent D&D book release apparently is quite good. Hmm. From yes, what I've was, heard. I believe we talked about it last a po- a podcast episode. Yes, uh, Brandon Lee Mulligan of Dimension 20 seems to be a very big fan of it. Also has a wonderful bit about how like the the border the border city to the the plane of mm. of Celestia is like oh every month everyone has to line up and slap the mayor otherwise we get sucked into heaven <laughs> and we need to stay on the material plane <laughs> so we can't be too lawful good <laughs> right <laughs> which I think is hilarious uh, the book of many things we do have a little bit of uh, of a bit about the book of many things and the bundle that it's going to have with a new version of the deck of many things that they're going to be releasing that comes out on November 14th as for Magic the Gathering the Doctor Who Commander decks are out now uh, we're not very interested in them there's some individual cards that look cool 
Sam's more into Doctor Who than I am. We've talked about this previously. Uh, we have the next set of Lord of the Rings. Those are going to be the scene art boxes, as well as some that are going to have some new card designs in them. That's on, going to be on November 3rd. And then the Lost Caverns of Ixalan, November 17th, is the next proper Magic the Gathering set with Ravnica Remastered. Seems like they're going to be doing a yearly beginning of the year remastered, remastered. set. Uh, that'll be January 12th. 2024 we also have an amazon storefront merch store tiktok live memberships where you can where you can help us support you can support our live streams and make them better yeah of course the big news of the week literally yesterday yeah yesterday they put a little blurb out on um, magic.wizards.com or whatever it is mtg got wizards and today they gave a full video oh yeah this this is a big this is a big deal in multiple respects a new crossover for Universes Beyond for Magic the Gathering was announced. Uh, the collaboration is with Marvel. Marvel Comics. Collaborating in a multi-year, multi-set deal. This is a massive, massive undertaking. Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast have been engaging in an enormous amount of crossover fun, very franchises, and the Magic the Gathering universe. But the next one is going to bring Marvel heroism and villainy to the popular card game. Marvel and Hasbro have announced a multi-year, multi-set deal that will bring a wealth of new cards and products to MTG, featuring iconic Marvel characters and concepts. Set to launch starting in 2025, it will be the first of many temple sets and products featuring the Marvel Universe, as shared by Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro Gaming President Cynthia Williams, quote, We are extremely proud to collaborate with Marvel to bring its iconic characters to fans around the world in new ways. These temple sets will build on the tradition of incorporating beloved fan-favorite characters and elements from world-class brands into Magic the Gathering. Further going on to say, trading cards have always been a part of Marvel's DNA. So this collaboration takes the, that experience to a whole new level with the depth that our storytelling and characters bring to the table. Can't wait for fans to see how Marvel Universe translates seamlessly into gameplay with these Match of the Gathering products and sets for years to come. With the first Marvel cross Match of the Gathering set coming in 2025. Sam. This is a huge deal. This is, yeah. Um, obviously with Disney... Of course, having a a branch of the Marvel franchise, uh, we they, they they own Marvel. They bought like most all of the rights. They they like they basically own the entire. They own all the comics. They only don't own the film rights to like Spider Man and X Men and like some tertiary characters surrounding that. That being said, there are obviously, but we expected. Dis she's licking the um, the space heater. What a fucking weird I cat. Anyway, uh, Disney, of course, has Lorcana, their very own TCG. Released this year. People ran over other people to get it. Um, and so we were predicting, as soon as we heard that, that, uh, well, there will never be a Marvel crossover with MTG because I, of this. I think we explicitly said that. I believe we explicitly said But, of course, Wizards of the Co or well, Hasbro, which, is, which owns Wizards of the Coast, also has the toy rights. Mm -hmm. They are the creators of the toys of the Marvel Universe. So I guess, and well, obviously this is not, this is not like, they're not like, hey, we're doing, we, they didn't decide they were doing this last week. They've been probably working on this for a while. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But, yeah, so this is shocking that this could even happen. I agree. I mean, obviously you get your mind swirling up with the tentpole sets. Yes. Multiples. Obviously you're thinking... You're going to have your Avengers set. You're going to have your X-Men set. You're going to have like, all sorts of things. You're going You're going to have, like, you, you might get, like, a Secret Wars set where it's, like, a whole bunch of superheroes in different iterations across time and universes. You could have a villainy set that's, that's like, Thanos and, like, all the different villains in the Marvel Universe. Obviously, you're going to be having Commander decks. It's the possibilities... With the amount of comics and storylines that are released, it literally could be endless. You could even see I we were we were discussing before the podcast with some of the some of the universes beyond things they've been doing, like Transformers releasing mm -hmm. with Brothers War. I could see a universe where like, oh, what about like we with they let's say they go back to Innistrad. What about how about we throw in some uh blade cards or it could be morbid time. Morbid. It could be morbid time. 
in Innistrad. You could you could throw in Craven the Hunter into into Lost Caverns of Ixalan, which won't happen. They are doing Jurassic Park through. with that, but there. I had never considered this an option because of Lorcana. Right. Everyone assumed that Disney's ownership of Marvel would lead to its own Lorcana set at some point in the future. So that kind of puts into question what is Lorcana doing right now? Yeah. Like, what is the state of that game if they're willing to go ahead with this deal with Magic the Gathering? Because though it was announced now, surely it's been in talks for a while, but. Also, surely, Lorcana has been in development for a very long time, too. And how, how does this... Is this a, a difference in relationship between Marvel and Disney? Mm-hmm. Is this a, we can see the writing on the wall that Lorcana isn't going to have the legs that we thought it would, and this is going to end up just being, like, a fun release that we do a couple of times and then dies off? I, I'm... I'm what, do you, what, do you, what do you think the implications here are for Lorcana? I think that, well... When Lorcana was coming out, a lot of people were like, oh, this is going to kill whatever TCG. And it's one of those things where it's like, the only thing that's going to kill the major TCGs, you know, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh!, MTG, Flesh and Blood, of course, is 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 not only up and coming, but looking to uh, stabilize as just a full-on, you know... As, as one of the big four. Big four. Make it a big four instead of three. And I think that the only things that are going to disrupt the big four are the big four. Yeah. Um... And not to mention that, but there are also the mobile games like Hearthstone, and Marvel has its own, Marvel Snap. Yeah, which apparently is very, very good, too. I, I also know that a lot of the designers who, some of the, well, a lot of the designers for Marvel Snap worked on Magic the Gathering first. That is true. And then went over and, and made, so. Same is true of Hearthstone and yeah. Arenas. And Arena, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. There, Obviously, I'm excited. Yes. Obvi- like, Marvel is great. We love Marvel. Have we fallen off of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in a post-Endgame world? Absolutely. They're releasing a lot of shit. Um, am, I, am I still exhausted with all of the universes beyond releases that are going to be coming out that I'm just not going to care about very much and would rather just have a Lost Caverns of Ixalan, a return to Innistrad, a return to Theros, a any of these other magic planes that are just like, oh yeah, sure, it's going to be a standard set, it's going to be normal, Mm -hmm. I'll go in, I'll get a pre-release kit, and we'll hang out, and we'll have a good time. I I long for that more. I love Wilds of Eldraine. The card designs are awesome, the art is cool, the theme, great, love it. Big fan. Now we gotta wait for Lost Caverns of Ixalan, and then beyond that, like... See, I I don't mind the, uh, the universes beyond where they are specifically, like, we're just putting out four commander... Four commander decks. Doctor Who's felt. Doctor Who, uh, the the Warhammer. Yeah. All of those where it's just like, all right, this is what we're doing. And it's very easy to then go, either I don't want to interact with, I don't care about that. Like we, we kinda did that with Doctor Who. You know, we opened up one one collector booster. I, I and know that was you're for a fan. And yeah. It's a birthday gift. It's a whole thing. But uh and they're doing that with Fallout where it's just going to be four decks. And yeah, sure, you you there are some cool cards in there that people will probably pick up as singles. But whereas like the um, Lord of the Rings set, which and I am I fully admit I'm a big hypocrite. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but like the Lord of the Rings set, uh, we were talking to one of our friends, Lincoln, who has said he's a uh, you know he's been playing for long time, long since he was well a kid. over a decade. Yeah. Um, coming up on two, I think two decades. And he's like, I just don't. He's like, I cared about two cards in 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 uh in the Lord of the Rings it was Orcish Bowmasters yeah and that and Gandalf Gandalf the, that he made a deck based on because you can kind of break them yeah and Orcish Bowmasters is like a modern staple now it's it's it's, it's an all it's an all format all star kind of yeah kind of but uh, so it's one of those things where it's like there are so many products but I don't mind these universes beyond that are just the commander stuff now when it gets into um we were saying last. You were saying last night while we were on stream, you know, you'd rather just have more, just more uh, uh, bit core sets. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, they're still putting them out. It's just they just seem so far apart now because there's so much in between them. That's fair. Because when when we were in the realm of like Dominaria United to Brothers War to All Will Be One to March of the Machines, like that was a boom, boom, boom. But like those were pretty close together. Mm-hmm. Um. 
And those were all standard legal. Those were all quote unquote core sets. Yeah. And now I just feel like I, it might just be like if we looked at the dates, I'm sure that it would space out somewhat similarly. Mm-hmm. But with all this shit in between, it's just so much. And the, like obviously Marvel is cool and, and we will definitely be speculating here on some fun decks and cards and archetypes and all that kind of stuff that we would like to see. But multiple sets and multiple products, like how long is Marvel going to go on for? Right. And obviously, obviously, I was thrilled with the Lord of the Rings set. I'm thrilled with the scene card boxes that are going to be coming out. uh, I bet Marvel will have a bunch of the scenes as well. Absolutely. And it's... I've... By the way, I'm very close to completing the collection of like the core cards from the Lord of the Rings set. That's very exciting for me. But it's gonna be so mad. Like, how long are we going to be talking about Marvel Match the Gathering releases now? Oh uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's another one they're gonna build up for a long time. Just like, hey, here's An Card. Yeah. Here's here's Captain America. Here is Thanos. Here's Thanos, your five color commander. Here's obviously Thanos is gonna be a five color commander. I'd be shocked if he wasn't. Oh right, We're collecting all probably the some yeah some sort of stone synergy. Here's your here's your Tony Stark Iron Man Boros equipment commander. Here your Captain America Azorius soldier commander. Uh, your like your Scarlet Witch fucking Rakdos commander. Like obviously, obviously you're going to have all of these cards. What now? Would I am I going to be very excited if there's a cool like Iron Man equipment commander that mm-hmm. would work well with a lot of the random equipment pieces that I already have and I can just slap together a fun Marvel themed deck? Of course. Are we going to buy a booster box of this of this Marvel set when it comes out and probably open the entire thing on stream? Probably. <laughs> you know, as we talk about it more, it's I keep thinking like, dang. It seems like the Avengers, they're probably going to be, if the commander deck of the Avengers commander deck, it feels like it's almost going to be just an equipment theme deck with like, oh, play Tony Stark, fetch the Iron Man suit, play Captain America to sacrifice our uh, equipment, deal damage, and then bring it back from the graveyard at the end of turn. Hawkeye, bow something. Just mm-hmm. like Thor's hammer. Oh, yeah. Mjolnir's going to be great. There's going to be an Iron Man suit that's probably going to be like a Thran bodysuit style thing. Yeah. Um. I don't know what they would do with the shield. I feel like the thing is, is that you always think there's going to be these cool mechanics. Like when we were talking about before Lord of the Rings released, I was like, how cool would it be if there was a Shards of Narsil card, Mm -hmm. equipment card that you could cast or an artifact card that you could do things and then you could pay into it or you could do something that would then cause it to flip. And then you have Andreal Flame of the West as it's been reforged as an equipment piece and how cool that would be. They didn't do that. Obviously, they weren't printing double-sided cards for Lord of the Rings, and we know that now. But there's so many fun, creative things. I would love if they would... If they're going to continue this route of Universes Beyond, which clearly clearly they are. Yeah. I would love if they just kind of let the design team loose a little bit and and just go hog-wild with some of the designs. Because... You, you can get really fucking crazy, like... Bruce Banner and the Hulk. Yeah. Double-sided transforming card. Um, you're going to have your Spellslinger style archetype thing with, like, uh, Doctor Strange. I think you could do, like, a mind control, steal your opponent's pieces thing with, like, Professor X. Mm. Some kind of equipment, uh, some kind of artifact, not equipment-related thing with Magneto yeah. for metal. Uh, prob- maybe even bring back, like, metal craft. That's a keyword. keyword. Like, there's so many interesting things, and I just want. I wonder. Obviously, I'm curious for how shackled they're going to be the designs, but uh, this is a massive, massive partnership. Um, Because we had talked about what the next big universes beyond thing is going to be after Lord of the Rings, because Lord of the Rings and magic just fit so well together. And we like Final Fantasy in the video game space. I think is about as big and appropriate of a match that you're going to be able mm-hmm. to get for match of the gathering. And now superheroes with Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> like what other spaces are they going to cross over? Like so many speculative things, but Sam, would you like to go and take yeah. a look at the TikTok live chat? Cause I'm sure there's people that have something to say. Yeah. We have a uh, slaggy says Mar- uh, MTG and Marvel feels like the breaking point in games in the game, turning into tabletop Fortnite. I, 
that is tabletop Fortnite, the Fortniteification yeah. of everything. The collaboration with anybody you can get your hands on. Yes, yes. I mean, ob- obviously, that started in some small way with like you could go as far back as like um, Space Jam. <laughs> yeah. if you really wanted to for a crossover and then like oh Power Rangers and fucking Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and uh, DC and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles yeah. Transformers and DC Mortal Kombat and DC <laughs> a Marvel versus Capcom the fighting games yeah. and then you've got the Avengers movie which is like the first cinematic thing where you're crossing over all these movies that are obviously made by the same studio and then like Ready Player One oh my and God. Fortnite, and it's like everything is crossing over, and it's into the Spider Verse, and even 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 fucking No Way Home. It's like yeah. okay, now we're pulling in other other universes, Spider Man franchises, and it's the the crossover culture is like really it's fun and it's kind of running its course a little bit, yeah, for me in a lot of ways, and I'm like I, ugh. Sure. Okay, I, the, the Fortniteification. I love that verb, though. That is really good. I'm a big fan of that. Faust uh, speculates the Infinity Gauntlet will kill half your deck. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You, you managed to get the Infinity Gauntlet out, and then you would tap it, and then exile half your deck. Yeah. It's hey. like... It, like Top down, you count out like half, or half your starting deck total or whatever for like the entire table or yeah. something, and then it exiles itself. That's fucking funny. <laughs> That's crazy. Be a big, big piece for mill decks. Oh yeah. Or or decks that just want to deck themselves and all that kind of stuff. Well, assuming that it was cheap enough to cast and activate. Uh, Mister Blimp, Blip. Yeah, Blimp. Uh, says, Lorcana team says they've planned to stay in the animated characters area. Interesting. I'm sure they say that. But you know that if Lorcana w- was to become a hit, you would be getting your Pirates of the Caribbean set. Mm. You would be getting your your Kingdom Hearts set. You would be getting your Marvel set. Like, every other... Like, they own too much shit. They own so much. If it obviously they could just stick to animated movies for several set releases for Lorcana and be totally fine. But if it were to become big, you and I all know damn well they would be pulling from every property they have access to. I would like the uh, Craft Singles card because Disney owns Craft. You really do just say things. Sometimes, no, you you really just say things. The Disney Channel set, <laughs> Han- Halloween. I would play Hannah, Hannah Montana. Montana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, ooh, Sky High, Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, oh, even Magic has been doing that. That that's the whole universe is beyond initiative in the first place. Yeah, is that exact mentality of we're gonna stick with you like our own things. Okay, fine. We'll we'll expand, and we're gonna make new planes of existence, and we're mm-hmm. gonna expand that way. And it's like, sure, let's do some let's do some Walking Dead cards. Why not? That sounds fun. Sure, let's let's do this. Let's do that, and then and then and then and then. Yeah, you have Lord of the Rings, and then you have a multi year, multi set, many product partnership with Marvel. Writing neat wall. <laughs> Somebody asked, do you set two cards and pass? I play two cards face down and pass the turn. That's and and my turn. That is Yu-Gi-Oh. That is Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, speaking of, I believe we have some other we have some other news that we should probably get to. Yes, yes. Uh, and do you have any do you have any other thoughts on Marvel and Magic the Other? I'm I am interested to see more as things to come. Because they said there'll be new keywords, there'll be return of old keywords, and Obviously, as big, you know, we were predicting on Lord of the Rings for so long. Yeah. Honestly, it was fairly mundane. It was good. Good It was fun. Well-designed set. Very thematic, beautiful art. What also probably sucks for announcing this is, as we were saying, there's other sets coming. There's there's the Final Fantasy set coming. 
we just kind of like i don't know but for me a lot of the things coming out next year were just shot over by this yeah not necessarily for excitement i am excited it's gonna be cool but more for the speculation and how big this yeah. is and like obviously we're excited like I, I'm looking forward to Lost Caverns of Ixalan, mm-hmm. the murder, Dinosaurs. Murder at Karlov Manor. Clues. Which, yeah. I'm... And the game, Clue. And the game, Clue. The Murder yeah. at Karlov Manor, Cluedo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mo- also a movie from 1999 starring Donald Faison. That is true. That is true. Which had multiple endings. It did. That were released in different parts of the country, which I thought was fucking awesome. You could never replicate that nowadays. No. You the, couldn't, the internet is... I, w- I think it would be hilarious if they did an East Coast and West Coast version of a movie. And so, like, oh, it releases at midnight, regardless of your time zone. And then people on the West Coast might be, like, looking for spoilers, and then they see, and then their movie's different mm-hmm. at the end. I think that would be hilarious. But it would literally only be a microcosm for, like, a day. I do remember, I don't remember what artist did this, but I, maybe maybe it's just something I made up in my mind, but there was an artist who had an album coming out, and they released the music a music video on a different platform so every different music video was released and this was this was years ago so like one was released on youtube one was released on vimo i think one may have even been released on pornhub um sure but i i they could totally do like that as a movie where it's like okay i don't know what that website is what well is you should look website? it up uh, not right now not right now no you should do that later uh, i've but, never heard of that website before but like do a all right we're releasing the movie on amazon hulu netflix youtube uh, uh, the movie part and just release the yeah, different, different ending, ending on, on each on one. Show. That'd be hilarious. I would love that. That would be so impossible to do. Oh, absolutely. Those streaming services would all want exclusivity. They would 100%. have. 100%. They, they like, they're like, yeah, you have exclusivity on the last minute and a half. Sure. <laughs> have at it. So the, the movie resolves. There's another half an hour of content and the last minute and a half is just, you know, yeah. you see Jackie Chan's butt in one, you don't in the other. <laughs> you Butt in one, not in the other. All right. So tell me about these play boosters. So Magic the Gathering boosters are changing forever uh, until they decide to change them again. So until recently, we had four different booster packs that would be releasing with every single set. You would have the set booster, you would have the draft booster, you would have the collector booster, and then the jumpstart booster. The jumpstart boosters for every set have already gone away because they fucking sucked and nobody bought them. Because they were basically rethemed or re branded theme boosters which nobody liked in the first place yes and they put the jumpstart branding on it because the core jumpstart set and then jumpstart 2022 were so good Uh, but they were not designed in the same way at all the collector boosters are obviously just you're spending a lot of money and you're getting really fancy cards sometimes that are worth something sometimes Mm mm-hmm And the reason they did a split between the set and the draft boosters originally from... They only ever used to have, like, one kind of booster pack. It was a booster pack. And then they did the split so that you could buy a slightly more expensive pack with the set booster. And then you would have access to more rares, more foils, different art treatments, art cards, that kind of stuff. Uh, And what they realized when they did that split is that limited gameplay, draftable gameplay dropped off precipitously and it became a a dichotomy of the good packs which were the set booster packs Mm -hmm. and then the bad packs which were the draft booster packs which in and of itself caused a problem with a lot of local game stores you would have local game stores that oftentimes when they buy products they need to sell that product to be able to buy the next one yeah and when you have a draft booster box that sits dead on the shelf because nobody's buying draft boosters and nobody is drafting anymore those just become dead or you start handing them out as prizes and then people are like why am i coming to play at this magic shop when they're only giving out draft boosters as the prize and it got a stigma attached to it and people were they they were struggling to sell more draft boosters caused a lot of inventory problems which if you're if you're trying to be good for your local game store uh they would just drop your product line entirely Mm -hmm. or they would only buy set boosters which would then not cause your draft boosters to sell so it also, like, just having a bunch of different packs is confusing. I'm literally reading off the problems they have. Made some magic boosters less desirable. Every booster buyer wasn't getting all of the cool stuff that they were designing. There weren't enough cards available. Colors weren't balanced in set boosters, so you couldn't use them for drafting. 
Uh, oftentimes they would design. I learned this recently because we I brought it up when we were opening up Lord of the Rings set boosters. How it felt like certain trios of cards were mm-hmm. showing up regular. Like yeah, you would get a Frodo, a Sam, and a Gollum back to back to back, and they were doing that on purpose. Okay, that well, is a thing that they were doing. Is we like have pattern recognition abilities. Tri- trios of cards would show up regularly, kind of like Legolas Gimli friendly rivalry. Yeah, would show up often together. Uh, the ratios of rarities had to shift between draft boosters and set boosters because draft boosters had fewer rares and mythics in them. Unless you were specifically trying to draft and have a balanced draft experience, you weren't buying them at all. So, so what you're so what they're saying is the the draft boosters weren't cool enough to get people to buy them, and the set boosters weren't usable enough to get people to draft with. You couldn't you couldn't use set boosters to draft, and because set boosters had better quality cards in them than draft boosters, people were buying set boosters and nobody was drafting anymore, and draft boosters were dying on shelves and in inventory. So, in an effort to resolve this, they're starting with the Murder Karlov Manor set they're going to remove set and draft boosters and replace them both with one kind of booster pack called the play booster, which has a breakdown thusly. It is a 14 playable card booster pack with 15 cards total. Slots one through six are always going to be commons. Slot seven is either going to be a common or a card from the list. Currently, it is unclear how that will affect draft environments if you pull a list card. Mm-hmm. Because list cards are all over the place. They could yeah. be, they can be... They they are limiting the list pool now mm. to like 40 uncommons and commons, or 30 uncommons and commons, and then 10 rares or mythics, and then there's like 10 special guests. So like characters that are thematic to whatever set they're releasing would be my assumption. I don't mm-hmm. really know what that is. But still, with the like we are saying, with those list cards, it's... Very random. It is very random. I don't know how they're going to balance that or change the drafting rules. Uh, because if you pull a list card, suddenly that pack has one less playable card in it. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you. You might be able to play with list cards in, in your draft pool now, which is probably the route that they're going to go. Right. Slots 8, 9, and 10 are always going to be uncommons. Slot 11 is going to be your rare or mythic rare, which might, I believe, can be foil, Mm. but isn't guaranteed. Slot 12 is your basic land. Slot 13 is your non-foil wild card, the wild card being a card of any rarity from the set. And then slot 14, you are guaranteed your foil wild card, which will be a foil of any card from common to mythic in the set. And then slot 15 is either going to be your add, token, helper, or art card. Um, That makes 14 playable cards, uh, one of them being the basic land, and then a 15th play aid slash add slash helper slash art Mm -hmm. card for the set. Uh, The specific percentages, you can go check out their article if you're interested in that. Obviously, this would be like a three-hour conversation if that were the case. Um, the one thing I will point out is that it is uh, in that slot seven where it's the list or commons uh, is 87.5% chance that it's going to be a common uh, and then the remaining percentage chance is going to be a card from the list uh, with ten with almost 10% being a common or uncommon reprint from the list 1.56% a rare or mythic and then 1.56% that is a special guest so in this breakdown of a pack, there are one, two, three, four slots that you possibly could get a rare or mythic. Yeah. So there are going to be packs that are going to have four mythic rares, one of them being a, ra- a mythic from the list, which is pretty cool. Chances are you're going to get your one rare or mythic, your three uncommons, your seven commons, and then probably a common or uncommon foil and then a common or uncommon mm-hmm. extra card. Yes. In these booster packs. Uh, A couple of things to note here. This is one less card than draft boosters. This is one more card than set boosters. This is fewer rares or mythics than a set booster, but more rares or mythics possible than a draft booster. Mm -hmm. The most important part is that this is going to be priced at the set booster price. So, 
Actually, no, hold on. Here, no, we have the breakdown right here. I was actually wrong. There's two more playable cards in a play booster than a set booster. There's one less non-foil wild card. There's one less non-playable object, which was the token or art. And then there's only a one in three chance of getting an art card instead of a guaranteed. Uh, and then there's no more connected strings of commons or uncommons. There's one less playable card in, than a draft booster. There's three fewer commons, but there is an additional non-foil wild card. There's an additional traditional foil wild card. And then a one in eight opportunity of getting a card from the list that didn't previously appear in draft boosters. And then a roughly one in three opportunity of getting an art card, which did not appear in draft boosters. I completely got that wrong. I'm How dare idiot. you? I was trying to go from memory. You absolute and, fool. I'm an adult, an idiot, and a daft fool. So they're going to have to change... I'm a daft punk. Oh, God. Uh, there's only going to be 14 playable cards now as opposed to 15 for previous boosters, for draft boosters. So this entire initiative is their attempt to simplify the product line. We've gone from what was recently four booster packs to now two booster packs, which will be the play booster and the collector booster, mm -hmm. which I think is a good thing for the consumer. It's going to be better than a draft booster. Yes. It's going to be a little bit worse than a set booster. And it's going to be at the set booster price. The, one of the big things that's not really being talked about now, to draft, you need three draft boosters. Mm -hmm. if, you bought three set, if you bought three set boosters... It's like twenty dollars. Yeah, twenty one dollars, I believe, because I think there's seven. seven bucks a piece. You now have to buy three of three packs at that price. You need to spend twenty one dollars mm -hmm. to draft now, which was previously like twelve to fifteen. If they're trying to revitalize draft in limited formats, maybe you should just have the packs cost a little less. They're going to be plenty profit margin. There's going to be... A, they'll be fine to sell these at the draft <laughs> booster price. But clearly, I think they, they see the writing on the wall. People are only interested in set boosters. They're willing to pay the set booster price. Yeah. Uh, so now we're going to offer them a little bit less than what they would get previously in a set booster in terms of rarity and foils. Uh, you get more play. You get more playable cards that are going to be commons and uncommons for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not guaranteed an art card, but nobody really gave a shit about the art card anyway. Yeah, lot of lot of lot of things at play here, Sam. How do you how do you feel about this entire change? Is this a good change for you? Bad? Are you, are you now going to play draft? I will probably not play draft. Um, I'm not great at draft. I've drafted on on MTG arenas quite a bit, and I'm bad at it. But that being said, in person is different. Um, I don't know. We've never really taken the opportunity to go to our local game store at release and go there for the release event. We've not done anything at a convention we've gone to where they draft because um, we're, we're mainly commander players. Yeah, we like, we like our constructed formats. I think that... I, w I will say the one exception to that is Jumpstart, just because yes. it's so simple. And Yeah, but that's not... It, the simplicity is, is where it is. Mm-hmm. I like I like the simplification of the product line. Um, yeah. We've you know one thing we've been saying is not only are there too many different um, sets, too many different products to buy, you know, different with all the universe beyond and all that. There's also too many options and within each product within line. each product line. Uh, so I like the simplification, but I don't know if this is you know the solution and and you gotta and you gotta think what comes down to when we do go at pre-release and we're like hey can we get you know this many pre-release boxes and they're like yeah here are your pre-release boxes also here's some extra packs for buying the pre-release box as your prize because set boosters were prizes for a while for for draft i don't know a lot um, of a lot of game stores were starting to use draft boosters as prizes though because they were just trying to get rid of them yeah because they would they would sit dead on shelves and I I love I love the simplification of the product. I'm never gonna be upset by that. Mm -hmm. I I like that draft the draftable packs are going to be more valuable and have more valuable cards in them. I don't like 
that they're keeping it at the more expensive price and they're now making draft more expensive. Mm -hmm. And if they wanted to improve the draft environment, they would just sell the packs for less. Especially now, they're priced at a, a, a style of pack that would previously have greater chances for foils and non and non foil rares and mm -hmm. mythics than these packs do. I'm also curious to see how this will affect the cards that are put into pack, like the cards that are designed in sets. Because obviously, uh, with a lot of with previous sets, you would have these signpost uncommons, these uncommons that were two colors and had a little bit more utility when you're specifically for drafting um, in order to kind of help you, you know, dr gauge what kind of deck you wanted to build as you were drafting. Um, and then also a lot of rares and mythics don't necessarily work super great in a draft environment that just because they take a lot of setup or they have very... Or they're so, designed for commander. Yeah. And so I'm wondering what these... In, so oftentimes the, you would get these kind of bulk rares, yeah. you know, uh, you're, you're that I'm wondering how that will, how that design space will change for the create for, for designers on the teams. You're yeah. I mean, they talked that they were going to have to change how they made sets anyway. Yeah. Uh, because draft was becoming a lesser experience than it was previously. The, I don't know. I, I, I will, we'll have to see how this plays out with, Murder at Karlov Manor. But two packs is better than four mm -hmm. for options. I like that you can just get a booster box now. Uh, I wish they would just call it a booster. Booster and collector booster. Booster, collector booster. Make it even simpler than that. Obviously, right now, they have to call it a play booster because there's three different boosters. But eventually, they could just drop that if they wanted. Um, I don't know. I think it comes down to what the draft experience is going to be like with 14 cards instead of 15. Mm -hmm. uh, what the draft experience is going to be like as they potentially shift how they design their sets a little bit. And how willing are players to just pay the same amount for a pack with a lesser chance at rares and mythics than previously. I wonder if this will eventually, uh, you know, if this is maybe, I don't want to say a test, but a, a gauge... For the next, maybe for the next year, they're like, okay, how does this look? And then maybe, you know, maybe draft just eventually becomes an arena's only thing. Like, because it, it's, you know, obviously, like we said, they're sitting dead on shelves. And if this doesn't revitalize them, and if they, I'm sure the designers and the players would love, love to put more effort into draft, but it's all up to the higher ups, right? Yeah. So maybe draft just becomes, you know, like alchemy at, at some point. I, First of all, I think Alchemy is a very fun design space. Oh, I people, think so, too. A lot of people great. shit on arenas, but it allows for card mechanics that aren't possible in paper, which is really fun. Um, I don't I don't think Draft is going to become just a digital format thing. I think it's going to be more popular on arenas and Magic Online than it is in paper just for logistical purposes. Um I also, I, they, they don't really mention in their press release on this how this is going to affect the the booster environment for arenas, mm -hmm. um, which is already kind of a weird mix anyway. Yeah. Because you can, you, they don't have a distinguishing, I think, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they, if their, if their situation just doesn't even change on arenas at all. I, I'm this. sure, yeah, we won't see much effect on arenas. Yeah. Um. I'm I'm concerned for the draft environment and how gameplay is going to play out. Obviously, draft packs are now going to have more rares or mythics, which means that they're going to be more bombs uh, in limited formats, which is going to change the dynamic of draft games very, very considerably. Or does that mean that they're going to be adjusting their set design and making rares and mythics less splashy? which will make them less valuable, right? which will mean the value of the cards and the packs are going to go down while remaining at the set booster price. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of things. We're going to have to see how it plays out in, in real life before we can pass judgment on this. I think it's a step in the right direction, but there's a lot of concerns left. This is just your uh, 
per story reminder that if you want a specific card, buy singles. Buy your singles. Uh, the last big story we've got for today is a D&D thing. As this is, as, as Duels and Man of Dorks is a D&D and MTG podcast. Ostensibly. Really, ostensibly. Ostensibly. There's not a lot of D&D news happening right now. But they did reveal more details about a Deck of Many Things bundle. Coming up later this year, we're going to be getting the Book of Many Things. They are also going to be bundling it with a new updated version of the Deck of Many Things. Uh, the two pair together in D&D's last major release for 2023 is going to be probably the last release for 5e as we know it before 1D&D comes out. It looks very pretty. Uh, they're going to be bundling in the Book of Many Things, which is a, a supplement book that's based around the Deck of Many Things, and a new version of the Deck of Many Things, which previously contained 22 cards with random effects. Players could draw one to create a chaotic effect, including sending their soul to another plane, and then also there's beneficial ones where you just become super rich or yeah. powerful or all this kind of stuff. Now Wizards is going to add 44 new cards to the deck, creating a total of 66. <sighs> A good example would be the new dragon card. The players that draw it suddenly have a dragon age egg hatchling appear before them, and the DM deciding on its color. The hatchling thinks the player is its parent. So that's the kind of chaotic energy you're going to be getting. Um, seems like I'm interested to see how the design of the deck of many things is going to change here. Mm -hmm. Obvious, obviously, we knew they were going to be doing some kind of fancy deck of many things. They're creating an entire book around the deck of many things. 22 cards. I mean, there's a lot of design that you can do there, but obviously they were going to be expanding it. Um, the bundle seems pretty cool. We're probably not going to buy it because we don't need a deck of many things. No. A lot of people are scared to add it into their games. See, and all, well, also there's a lot of third parties that make decks of, well, one many things and then two their own mini whatever. Mm. Um, and in obviously the old deck of many things, the the more standard. Why is, why is Shadowheart just falling in that? That advertisement. Anyway, Baldur's Gate advertisement at the bottom of the page. Anyway, uh, there are definitely some cards that are a little not as effective in, in what we are aware of as the current D&D play. Um, such as the one where it just says, gain this much XP. And uh, it, as far as you know, most people on the internet talk, very few people still use XP, preferring to go with milestone leveling. Mm. Um, but it's cool. It is, it is, it can be disruptive to your campaign, but hey. Yeah. Uh, they changed a little bit of how the deck was designed as well. Wizards has designed the deck as a form of tarot card where players can have their fortunes read and the DM have an additional use for it too. Building out a dungeon or even an entire campaign. Each card represents a person, place, treasure, monster, or situation for a DM to use with different effects on reversed cards, i.e. when the card is upside down. The new deck of many things thus offers a total of 660 different options for players and DMs to discover based on how the card is oriented and the different cards of, at various different levels for the campaign. Uh, the design, the lead designer of this new deck of many things, where's his name? Tondro. Where is that? It was up here. Oh my gosh. Jason Tondro said, quote, the first card represents where the party is before the adventure starts, kind of like what they've been doing or the starting situation. And we cross that with a card that's the inciting event. Someone staggers into the tavern with an arrow in their chest and a map in their hands, right? Something that kicks off the adventure, end quote. DMs then use a card to represent the journey and the dungeon entrance and more for the challenges the players face. Finally, it concludes with a, quote, guardian card and a treasure for the reward so it's going to have multiple uses where it's not just an in-game item for chaotic elements in a D&D campaign it's going to actually help you design adventures what's interesting is that kind of that idea that design idea harkens back to like what are you know the Gary Gygax and, mm -hmm. and people were playing in their basements back in the 70s which was um you know we're not old enough to be back then but plenty of people talk about it where D&D &D was you build your character you're in a tavern mm -hmm. you go to the dungeon uh, and you you go through the dungeon, you tap every stone to make sure with a 10 foot pole to make sure it's not trapped. You find out you have too much gold. You have to go back to town, hire a hireling to come, you know, drag your gold. There was no there wasn't really a lot of plot. No. But so this at least suggested design, you know, 
possible seems like absolutely a great place to start or a great place uh, for you to start your campaign or a great great intermediary between um, adventures the hearkening back to the old the olden the ways olden ways the olden ways um probably without any racist undertones would be my guess got hopefully they wizards of the coast has uh will pay the right people though to read their their stuff before they send it to the printer yeah uh one thing uh they they did commission new art for all the ai art controversy oh good fun fact fun good for them good for them uh the deck of many things bundle will be released digitally on october 31st and on uh D beyond and a physical release on november 14th good for them lastly a little wrap-up item uh We've talked a lot about Universes Beyond in Magic the Gathering. One of the Universes Beyond is Fallout. Yes. The Fallout video game series. Uh, we get some uh, set spoilers for Fallout. Uh, there's four commander decks, uh, one of them in Mardu, one of them in Jeskai, one of them in... Oh, what's black, green, blue? I can never remember. I can never remember either. And then one in uh, red, red, green, white. white. Another color combo that I don't know the name of because I don't have a deck of that color. <laughs> so, Sam, are there any are there any big standouts here for you? I mean, I think the what's going to be interesting um, is going to be the fact that they're bringing back the energy mechanic from yes. Kaladesh uh, in the science, which is the Jeskai with Dr. Madison Lee as the he- heading that one up. Uh, I think, th- I think though, uh, one of the most interesting cards that they've previewed so far for me is uh, the Nuka-Cola machine, mm-hmm. which says uh, one tap, create a food token. It has the ability and has the triggered ability. Whenever you sacrifice a food, create a tapped treasure token. We with- are all thankful that it is tapped. Tap, right? <laughs> but with, uh, with all of the food support that's coming through uh, the Lord of the Rings sets and uh, Eldraine, mm-hmm. um, not only have we seen, you know, obviously the the, the um, well, this uh, not only have we seen food tokens. Well, now we see actual food cards. So we have things like the the Ginger Brew, which is a food golem, Sir Ginger, uh, and the Candy Trail, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, this Nuka Cola machine is going to slot very well into a lot of food synergistic decks. And just whenever using the food for their intended purpose, you also, it says when you sacrifice a food, there's plenty of cards that allow you to sacrifice foods for other things other than yeah, paying yeah. two and sapping it to gain three life. So, But this does, flavorfully this works, because you pay one, you pay a mana to, and tap it to get a food, like you're putting something into it, you're putting money into a machine, mm-hmm. then you get a ball of Nuka Cola, and then... The, the thing in Fallout is that Nuka-Cola bottle caps are the currency. Yes. So when you ref, when you pop the top, well, you you drank the, you consume the food, and now you have another coin. Mm. I love it. Food's been getting a lot of support. Equipment's also been getting a lot of support. Uh, <laughs> obviously, there's going to be some delicious equipment in Fallout. But uh, you even get some more, uh, some more equipment support with uh, the Saga Vault 101 birthday party. Uh, the first chapter, you get a 1-1 one, one soldier and a food token. The second and third chapters are you may put an aura and equipment card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield. If an equipment is put onto the battlefield in this way, you may attach it to a creature you control. So just here's some free equipment and put it on your shit. Uh, hammer time, baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big ol' hammer time. Obviously, um, I have I have the beginning. I have a slapdash equipment deck. Yeah. I slowly feel like eventually I'm going to find that one equipment commander that I just love so much that I'm like, well, I have 80% of this deck already. Let's slap this bitch together and let's ride, you know? <laughs> uh, I also want to point out the Rad Storm, <laughs> a three and blue instant that's just storm proliferate. proliferate. So simple. So simple. I love I love when they print new storm cards. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's so there, uh, I don't know if you know, but there's a storm scale. Mm-hmm. Um, which is uh, Mark Rosewater's scale of it's it's every mechanic that's appeared, every keyword that's appeared, just ranked as how likely they are to reappear in future sets. And obviously, any of the evergreen ones, like flying, is a one. It's always going to appear in every set. Uh, Menace, so, haste, that sort of thing. Storm, however, is like is nine. I think it's 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 so it's rare. It's because it's such a a hard um, mechanic to design around. Yeah. 
I love I love Storm. Uh, thankfully, most of the Storm cards suck. They Sadly. they have to be in that dedicated deck. Yeah, but four mana instant speed stormy proliferation. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a damn good time. It also sounds like a damn good time. Uh, we are fans of D anD D. We are fans of D anD D. I believe this is the backup commander for the Mardu deck. I believe you're correct. Mr. House, President and CEO. Whenever you roll a four or higher, create a three three colorless robot artifact creature token. If you rolled a six or higher, instead create that token and a treasure token. Then you can pay four and tap it to roll a six sided die plus an additional six sided die for each mana from a treasure spent to activate this ability. Um six sided die, that sounds pretty balanced. Yeah. It's fairly reasonable. You gotta you gotta roll a six or, or you know, four, five, or six to actually get into the benefit. It's Samuel, half. we've had We've had two D&D set releases where you're we rolling have. D20s. Yeah. Uh, also many other sets where you're rolling D6s and D20s and, and larger die. And so, out of the D&D sets, there are things that just let you roll at advantage. Yeah. And other, other you know, and anytime you roll a die, roll two die and take the higher. Ignore one result. Uh, of course, the Barbarian class. Yeah. That's notably that one. In in the correct color identity, uh, the Red Dragon. The re- in the correct color identity. Oh, all the, I mean... Obviously, the 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 white and black dragons maybe not as as synergist. Well, the white one does create you uh, tokens. Mm-hmm. The red one, obviously, the treasure tokens. That's the big one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the black one does some recursion. Uh, maybe not as important in this token deck. But there's, there's also a lot of cheap cards that let you roll d twenties. Which, whenever you're rolling them, at worst, you're getting a three three artifact creature. At best, you're getting a 3-3 artifact creature and a treasure token. Mm-hmm. In addition, a lot of those roll a d20 things create treasure tokens in oh, yeah. themselves. Um, I did, whoo, ha, yeah, baby, roll me some dice. Even even you could you, even the um, heads I win tells you lose. There's a lot of dice rolling in that. It's mostly coin it's flips. Coin flips yeah. Mostly coin flips. There is dice rolling in it. Is there? There's a there's a couple of dice rolling cards that are pretty powerful. Anyway, uh, love rolling a die. Love random, love when you just get benefits for doing it. Love that it's just yeah. I roll some roll some d sixes. Yeah, you can also depending on what you got, you can roll it twice and pick whichever one you want, or you get other benefit. There are other cards that give you benefits when you roll dice, particularly um, the the uh, infinity. Wait, wait, wait uh, universe. Oh, infinity, infinity. That one. Yeah, that one also had a lot of of ways to roll dice benefits when you're rolling dice that kind of stuff this deck's going to get out of hand uh do you have anything else that stands out in particular uh we do see on these previews that uh well first off crucible worlds will be reprinted that's a, a great card a, sta- a staple in um graveyard land decks uh, but we do see that there will be the serialized versions, it looks like, of all the bobbleheads, which if you played Fallout, there's a bobblehead for each of the um, main stats, as well as I believe there's one for each of the uh, skills that's in there. Um, but we see the Intelligence bobblehead, which is a three mana, uh, t- three mana mana rock that also has a uh, five and tap to draw X cards, where X is the number of bobbleheads you control. So it looks like there's going to be some bobblehead synergy out there. Yeah, as as mana rocks that can tap, at least this one can tap for one of any color. So uh, like shrines almost. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I love a shrine. I always find it difficult to build a shrine deck though. It's very, it's a very dedicated deck. Yeah. There's one way to really build that deck. Yeah, which is, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you're also going to get some cool extended art, new uh, Fallout themed, like you, you mentioned the Crucible of Worlds, Arcane Signet, Soul Ring, Wasteland. Um, one of one of low key my favorite keywords on an instant card for vats two black black instant with split second as long as this spell is on the stack players can't cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities uh, I love it particularly when it's attached to board wipey effects like choose any number of target creatures with equal toughness destroy the chosen creatures yes so big fan of split second that's gonna hit a huge amount of tokens and then just incidental things oh yeah and you get to choose. So it's like, I'm gonna choose all your tokens, and your friend's like, "Hey, don't don't kill my don't kill my Llanowar elves." Okay, I'll ignore that one. And of course, we are talking in the very Man. casual commander version of things. We are not competitive or CDH kind of guys. Fuck you, Llanowar elves. Uh, but if we're going to talk about um, some rude competitive-y, somewhat casual but competitive-y things, the wise Mothman mm. paired with the feral ghoul getting. Uh, 
rad counters is going to be a new counter kind of like a poison counter but instead of you lose the game it's uh you mill that many cards in your pre-combat main phase uh and then for each non-land card you mill that way you lose a you lose a life and you lose one of the rad counters uh but in a deck where you're going to be creating a lot of rad counters Mm -hmm. awkward (laughs) gonna die by milling gonna get decked son anyway i'm not a big fallout guy I enjoy Fallout. It's fine. That's fine. I, it, it, Honestly, I'm a, I'm more interested in the things that are going on here than I am for the things that happened in Doctor Who. That's fair. That's fair. These mechanics are more useful and more playable, whereas Doctor Who was very thematic to Doctor mm-hmm. Who, and they work well together. Yeah. Not necessarily well with other things, which I totally get that. That is all of the news items that we have for today. Uh, every week we record this, or every other week we record this podcast live on TikTok. Sam is going to look through the chat on TikTok for any questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas. In the meantime, you can get this podcast every other week on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, our YouTube channel as well. We also have our TikTok, where over 40,000 of you follow us, where we do our weekly Monday Night Magic live streams, where we play Magic the Gathering one-on-one, two-player commander. Sometimes we play Jumpstart, sometimes we open up preview kits sometimes we open up just random packs that we've gotten we also have an instagram a youtube discord x all that kind of stuff samuel what do we got from the tiktok live chat batch id D D asks how do you ask a longtime group that plays in your town if you can join them if they don't know you um get to know them yeah <laughs> <laughs> probably be a good starting point and then don't bully your way in mm-hmm um, like they, people don't owe you anything. You might want to join them. You should probably just try and like, if you, wherever you are seeing them, you should probably try and be like, "Hey, can I hang out sometime?" Or what are you guys doing? Or invite them to something. And very importantly, you know, be aware of the group dynamic. If it is a group that's been playing a long time, but it's like an adventurers league, or like they start as an adventurers league, um, maybe easier to get into. But you know, if the group already has six, seven people in it. Even if even if you're the coolest dude on earth, probably not gonna add probably not gonna add you. That's a big group already. Um, Dan Orr asks. That was a that was a that was a quick transition I just did. <laughs> Dan Orr asks, what keywords annoy you the most? Annoy you the most? Um, <sighs> the combination of death touch and first strike. <laughs> oh, that is a rough one. That's bad. Gosh, keywords that bother me delve you don't like delve anytime someone's delving i don't trust it <laughs> i don't trust it one fucking bit i'm gonna play one i'm gonna tap one blue and then exile seven cards in my graveyard <gasps> draw three cards okay Fuck. <laughs> it's always it's always scary that's fair it's always scary prowess annoys me <laughs> i love prowess <laughs> you know what annoys me even more prowess prowess yeah prowess prowess is bad um cascade cascade, cascade can get a little fucky uh love a lifelink lifelink's fun i i I don't mind i i'm annoyed whenever i'm playing against lifelink but when i get down to it it's like okay you played some good wholesome magic there yeah i love a wholesome magic uh trample always makes me afraid because that's usually on big big old boys yeah or it's on a zero one yeah love split as as i yeah yeah (laughs) that is true that is true i will answer i want to answer the opposite uh a mechanic that i really love but it's not often around but and 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 thus never get to play with is rebound yeah i really like rebound and that's why i built that taiga mojo time master deck at one point it wasn't great for our one-on-one play especially because you were you were having you had a very aggro deck um but taiga has gives all instants and sorceries rebound so you cast it and then on your next upkeep you get a cast it for free i love that yeah that's a good one that is a good one rebound is a great mechanic split second i really like um menace Menace. I'm a big fan of Menace. Most of the keywords are good, is the thing. The ones that aren't good, you don't ever see. Right. There's a reason for that. How do you... Oh, uh, what's the one... Um, dredge. Oh, Dredge. Yeah, that one. I uh, love Dredge. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm good. The gra- All the graveyardy ones. I don't trust them. Don't trust them. Love for graveyard recursion. Uh, Shadow and Skylar asks, how often do you play D&D? My kids want to watch. <sighs> Not nearly enough. And we don't stream D&D. 
We do not. We talked about streaming D&D at one point, and then I think we both kind of quietly had the realization that way too many people stream D&D, and most of them are bad at it. Yeah, and, and it's also... At least for us, since we work very we work very different schedules, as we are doing this at a well one thirty now on a Tuesday. Yeah, uh, be hard to get set up and actually everybody together. Yeah, it's a scheduling thing. Um, I don't play nearly as often as I would like to, and the group that I'm most able to consistently play in, uh, I'm not so like I'm I, I enjoy I'm enjoying it. Um, it's a work game, mm-hmm. so. It means I have to spend more time at work. And I spend time with people that, you know, I enjoy being around them at work. I wouldn't necessarily want to hang out with them outside of work. Yeah. There's like maybe two there that I would hang out with outside of work. And that's kind of it. Yeah. Maybe three on a good day. But I would love I would love to play more games here. We have a fucking dope setup here. And we don't ever play. Yeah, my friend's uh, micro D&D group came over on, on Sunday. And, and we were talking. And I was talking to them about it. I was like, yeah. We like have you know we built the table. We have we have so many books and minis and at one point rain and maps lighting lighting now like and we just all of our we had several games going and they just all fell apart for different reasons. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um. Ooh. Moving on. Drunk. Zerker. Drunk Zerker asks thoughts on the current amount of TCGs. So we mentioned this a little earlier in the podcast. And obviously they're the 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 big three plus two plus that are two. so there's Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, and Magic. Magic that you see a lot about. There's Flesh and Blood, which is quickly, you know, gaining in popularity and mm-hmm. uh, has been coming up for the past several years. Very consumer friendly, plays very well from what I hear. Um and then of course Lorcana got its big boom this year. I would even I would even put a little little honorable mention there for Digimon. Digimon that's another fairly I, large TCG. I did want to. I wanted to learn Digimon at uh, at Gen Con this year. I just never got the chance. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. And, and then of course there are all of the um, all the anime. anime. <sighs> yeah, there. Are, you know, if you're at this point, if you're an anime, you're probably going to make your own TCG. Probably. I mean, there's a Dragon Ball one. There's a Naruto one. There's a My, My Hero. Hero. There's like there, every fuck. There was a Kingdom Hearts TCG. There were like you can. There's so many like one-off TCGs that they are just banking on people like, ooh, I want to, I want, ooh, I like these characters. I want shiny cards. And I honestly, I'm as okay, I'm okay with that. As Why far not? as yeah, as, as far as the fact that there, it's a trading card game or it's a collectible thing. I think that you know, doing a a TCG for a collectible thing for your is for your franchise is pretty all right. Um, as long as you don't go into it hoping that this very specific one will be very popular, you know, or or will be will be the next of yeah. the big ones. Yeah, uh, we might we might as you said as we dubbed it earlier, we might see a fourth enter, and it'll be the big four, and it yeah. would be it would probably be flesh and blood. And and the only things that are going to kill the big four are the big four themselves. Yeah. And I wouldn't even, I don't even think they're going to kill each other. No, they're going to kill themselves. Yeah. Magic is by far the most on its way to killing it, itself. It's, it, you know, it's Revenant's engines. Yeah. I'm, ever since Magic 30, I think they've been slowly making some steps in the right direction. Uh, in other ways, making steps in the wrong direction. I think Wizards... But that's the... also just kind of the wrong direction, quote unquote. I think it's my own personal bias more than... I think Wizards of the Coast is just becoming more aware of the community that's around it, um, and slash Hasbro, because obviously we saw a bunch of crap from M- Magic and D and D at the same time. Yeah, and now both of these both sides have taken steps to be like, "Hey, we're sorry. We're sorry. We're okay. Please trust us again." Uh, but even but Wizards of the Coast is really at the epicenter of a lot of these because Wizards of the Coast was the original printer of Pokemon. Back in the day as well. They no longer are. I think Pokemon owns their own printing for it now. Uh, But, like, all the original, like, really expensive, like, base set Pokemon cards were Wizards of the Coast products. Um, Then Konami's obviously just out there being Konami. Being like, oh, your your anniversary set was $1,000 for a set. Here's a a bunch for $5. Here's here's a $40... 
anniversary box that gives you a fuck ton of old reprinted packs as well as just a bunch of valuable iconic Yu-Gi-Oh cards and 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 and, and. Uh, you can spend your thousand dollars on a million of proxies. <laughs> that being said, we're not super in tune with any. We're we're in tune with the magic. Yeah. What's going on in magic? Yeah. Um, but due to the fact that we don't play the other ones, we're not super in tune with them. I'd be I'd be curious. I am curious because I know obviously D and D and and magic both had shit hitting the fan at the same time. Yeah. But the same thing had as as I've talked to our friends who play Warhammer. Basically, one year before that, all that, Warhammer had a bunch of shit hit the fan from doing similar things. And I talked to one of our friends uh, who was who was a um, commentator for Smash tournaments. And the Nintendo had done the same thing in just a few years prior. Mm-hmm. And that's if if I were to write a uh, or to were to make a video documentary, I would love to research all of these different franchises that have basically done the same thing where they're like, we're going to crank our our communities and try to milk them for all the money they're worth, you know, get our cash cows into the into the into the machine. And then the community turns around and goes. Go kill, go fuck yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, I I would love to I would love to do a multi part series on just each one of them. Each you know giving each one an episode. That'd be fun. That'd be an interesting thing to for, to research. Yeah, do that. Go for it. Um, what was the the TCG that our friend Cisco over at Role Playing oh, yeah. Degenerates He's Zoo something Zoo? Oh, okay. So our friend Cisco, hold on. Metazoo. Metazoo. This Cisco is obsessed. Which with this Metazoo. is we we uh, we, we got another up and comer right now. He was telling us about this is a super cool one uh, as well because it uses um, uh, real life um, or like actual world lore and um, mm-hmm. like uh, like mythology. And mythology, shit. yeah. Um, they did a lot of cri- you know North American cryptids and then. Um, other other like i know they did a i believe he was saying they're doing a japanese set if if you're into like that earthbound art style that like old studio ghibli the art on it is really really cool also packs and cards are very inexpensive compared to the big four Mm -hmm. big three right now but MetaZoo is up and coming. I would, I would, I would like to. I just wanted to mention that as a nice little honorable mention. Uh, I feel like if Cisco listens to the podcast, he'd be very offended that we didn't bring up it when talking about TCGs. Anything else in the TikTok live chat? Um. Uh, let's see. We have Nevin who asks, "MTG Commander Standard and why?" Uh, we play Commander because that's what we learned first. It's what we learned first. It's the most popular format. It's the easiest one to just pick up and play, and you only need one copy of a card. Craw Daddy asks, "Do you have mana on your arm?" I do. I have all the mana symbols from uh, Dominary United, ex- the uh, the the uh, stained, set art, the stained glass, yes. uh, t- tattooed upon his lower bicep. Um, user and a string of numbers will be a good commander to go up against a slivers deck, something with a lot of removal. Lots of removal, uh, particularly probably a white deck because of exiling removal as opposed to graveyard rem- like des- destruction mm-hmm. removal because. Uh, there's not a keyword that uh, that gets around exiling quite yet, except phasing out. But that you have to yeah, you, yeah, you have to have other out. ways to interact. Yeah, uh, Craw Daddy, back at it asks if uh, if so. <laughs> he says if you do have man on your arm, you should be able to drop an extra basic land on every turn uh, for your commitment to the game. No, <laughs> I mean I like it. I'm sure you do. Um. Now it's on my uh, now it's on my tattoos. Um, Ryan asks, "Am I tripping, or is that a tattoo of Gears of War and Assassin's Creed?" Indeed, it is, Ryan. Indeed, it is. Indeed, it is. That was my first one. Tattoo cast. Ooh, okay. This is. Uh, I think this will be the last one we ask answer. Uh, it's from user. It says, "Against friends, do you play to f- to win, or do you play for fun?" <sighs> At the end of the day, here's the thing. When it gets to the end game, play to win. Mm-hmm. When it, when you're on turn three, you don't need to be countering someone's commander. When you're on turn two, you don't need to remove their arcane signet. Like, don't be a dickhead. Um, 
at the same time, you should probably be playing with it. And I, I kind of blew up on one of our games. It's like, maybe play with your best interest in mind mm -hmm. when you get to the end game and someone's about to win. Maybe play at, at that point. If someone's going for the dub and you have a way to stop them to keep the game going and f to give yourself a chance to win, maybe do that instead of just destroy the one person who can stop the person from winning. You're not playing two headed. You're not playing two headed giant. Unless you are playing two headed giant. In which case, by all means. Which, by the way, two headed giant commander was so much fucking fun when we played it. <laughs> what? I highly recommend that format if you want to spice up your commander lifestyle a little bit. I would say make sure. It, the only thing I say was when when I play is yeah i think winning is fun but i think it's also uh, uh very clear when the game is no longer fun yes at that point you need to end it um, uh, when we do monday night magic i think we both quietly agreed it's like let's not be dickheads on the first couple turns and then wait until it's like who's gonna win this turn or next turn and that's also partially because we're on stream and and we're also kind of you know interacting with chat yeah. and we're all, so it's like uh the game missing, is only missing triggers and land drops and <laughs> It's fine. Unless there's anything interesting left to say, Samuel. This has been pretty good. I also need to get back to work because it is a middle of a Tuesday. Yeah, don't worry about that. Who cares about work? Uh, but yeah, Marvel and MTG, man. Who would have thought? Anyway. Who would have who thought we'd end up here? Not me. We'll see what happens in the next year. Next year. Anyway. Guys, thanks for hanging out. We love you very much. And as I always like to end my game nights with, let's Misty step out of this goblin orgy.